This morning, I'm excited to fin- uh, not finish to continue on in week three of the Blessed Life. How many of you have been enjoying uh, this series? It's it's really I'll tell you I've enjoyed uh, thank yeah. You, I've enjoyed studying for this series. Uh, it has been, uh, it's, you know, I, obviously we study for each and every sermon that I do, but um, I've really enjoyed the study uh, for myself personally in this, uh, in this sermon series. And so, uh, the, you know, last week, the first week, we, we started talking about uh, the blessed life. We talked about the need for a heart transplant. And if you weren't here that first week, let me encourage you, go to the website. Uh, you can you catch it on calvarylighthouse.org. Uh, we've got all of our sermons there, and so you can catch that first week of the blessed life. Uh, we talked about the need for a heart transplant, talking about uh, shaping who we are and our understanding of what God's doing in our lives. Uh, and then last week, uh, we talked about the second step, which was immediate obedience. You know, we all like to think that we obey well, uh, but we can always grow in that. And our ability to obey immediately what God is saying to us actually gives us the ability to obey better in the future because as we obey, obedience becomes a habit. And so as we look at moving into that blessed life, uh, our ability to have a heart transplant and obey God uh, is important and allowing him to bless us uh, greatly. This week... um, this week we're talking about something a little bit more uh, controversial. See, anybody can agree with the fact that we need to have a heart like Jesus, and anyone can agree that we need to obey uh, God and obey him quickly. Uh, but today we're talking about something a little bit more controversial, uh, and because, you know, anytime a pastor starts talking about um, wealth and money, people start getting a little touchy. It just, it just happens. Uh, the first two weeks, no one argues with that stuff. But when you start getting in the money, that's when people start going, oh, whoa, 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 pastor, now you're starting to meddle. Now, now you're getting into the things that you shouldn't be talking about. And I, I want you to understand, this blessed life that we're talking about, it all works together. Uh, we sometimes separate out our life to think that there's a church life, and then there's a, there's a work life, and there's a home life. There's not really, that's not really how it works. There's life, and God has to be honored in all of it, not just part of it. So today, as we prepare uh, to get into this conversation um, about the blessed life, I want us to start at the beginning uh, so we can get the right understanding. And I mean, I really, I really want to start at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1. Now, you don't have to turn there. You're probably familiar with the story of creation. You know, in the beginning, God created the... Okay, heavens and the... We'll get better. It's okay. We got, God created the heavens and the earth. And if you read Genesis chapter 1, it walks through all of the things that God created uh, over the days of creation. And then in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, here's what it says. It says, then God said, let us make man in our own image. Understand when it's man, uh, he's talking about humankind, not just men. And so let's not be sexist in our presentation of God. Let us make man in our own image, after our own likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, for me personally, some of the creeping things, uh, they can keep to themselves. I am not a fan of spiders, insects, and bugs, whereas my son is fascinated. Live or dead, it does not matter. Uh, I am not interested in creepy things at all. Uh, but here's, I want to I highlight something, a very important word in this, uh, in this verse. It says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Today, this is, this is a foundation of our message as we get into the broader conversation about the blessed life. God created the world and then gave us dominion over it. He left it to us to manage. God created it and then gave it to us to manage. Uh, Psalms 24, 1, it says, The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. God created the world and then appointed humans to manage his creation. That's what God did, okay? That's the foundation of our conversation today. Uh, anybody remember DuckTales and Scrooge McDuck's? Yeah, Scrooge McDuck. It was a, it was a popular cartoon. You know, we are talking about it this morning. Um, 
at the worship team, we start to prayer, and I'm not going to say who it was, but the initials are JS. Uh, we're talking about, um, we said, hey, I, I said, I know, I'm sure this was one of your favorite cartoons. And he goes, well, if you want to go back to my favorite cartoons, you got to go to the Flintstones. I said, oh, we got to go to the 60s for your favorite cartoon. Because uh, this was uh, early, late 80s, early 90s. But how many of you remember Scrooge McDuck? He had a tower of money. And he spent a good portion of his time trying to acquire more money or protect his money, because somebody was always trying to take his money. Uh, and every now and then he took a little break uh, so that he could go swimming in his money. You know, money was a very important thing for Scrooge McDuck, wasn't it? Money is a very important thing for a lot of us, isn't it? Money is a big motivator for a lot of life. It's just a fact. It's the world we live in. So as we talk today, I want you to understand, we're talking about wealth and its impact in our lives. So if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Starting in verse 10, Luke chapter 16, it says, One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, how many of you grew up um, reading the King James. How many, that was your, that was your, yeah, okay, so if you are, if you're used to the King James, what's the word? They don't use money. What's the word? They use mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. You know, mammon is a really churchy word. Uh, you don't, you don't, you don't hear it outside the church, right? You don't hear, you don't hear somebody at work saying, you know, I got an increase in my mammon today. Uh, that's not, they, when they get a pay raise, no one gets an increase in mammon. That's not how it works in the world. But in the church, uh, mammon has been a word that has been used uh, to talk about wealth. And there's been a lot of teaching on it. How many of you, have you ever heard somebody, te- this is, this is, there is a really, um, popular, well-known teacher uh, that he's, he's, a, he's wonderful in so many aspects, um, but he has a teaching talking about Mammon, that Mammon was actually the name of a Syrian god from ba- Babylon, and he was the image of wealth, and you know what? That's not true. I've done a lot of research this week. It preaches really good, but it's not true. There's nothing in the historical text that confirms that Mammon was a god in Babylon. Uh, that's why we have to make sure that we, um, we really study when we listen, when we hear, because man, that makes good preaching, but it doesn't necessarily make good theology. <laughs> and so uh, the, the, the belief was that mammon, that was a spirit that rested on money. And that's, I've heard, how many of you have ever heard that taught? Anybody ever heard that? I've heard that taught. It's, it's, it's a very interesting position. Unfortunately for those preachers that have taught that, uh, it sounds really good, but their hermeneutics is, um, is off. Their, their study is bad. It's one of those things that it's oftentimes we can find a single source to confirm our position, but you really shouldn't create a whole theology on a single scripture. You really shouldn't create a whole position on one good teaching. You really need to study and expand. And so uh, that's why I encourage you to study the Word of God, read commentaries, research topics. But here when we look at this, Jesus is using a word unique in this context. The word mammon only appears four times in the New Testament. Three of them are from Jesus, and then one of them is a repeat of somebody saying what Jesus said. And throughout the New Testament, there's multiple words for money, but this is the only place where Jesus uses the word mammon. And that was, it was really interesting because I, I do think, I do think there's something unique in this context. And while Mammon was not a Babylonian god or a Syrian god of wealth and money, I do believe Mammon is a unique reference to money, and it serves a very important purpose for us in our conversation today. You know, so, it, you know, it, it's very clear what it says. It says you can't serve God and serve money. You can't serve both, right? Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have money. Doesn't mean everybody has to be poor. Doesn't mean you have to give everything you have. But what it does mean is that you can't let money rule your life. So mammon, it's a, it was a very common word. 
uh, in Jesus' day. It was actually an Aramaic word uh, that meant wealth or riches. And if you look at the next verse, if you look at verse 14, it talks about the Pharisees. We're not going to read it. It talks about the Pharisees who loved money. The money-loving Pharisees. How many, you know, I think all of us in church can understand, we, we don't want to be money-loving people, do we? Can't be money-loving people. Because when we become money-loving people, all of a sudden our life is ruled and dictated by money. So when we look at mammon, here's the question that I have for us to look at. Uh, does that mean when mammon, when it says you cannot serve God and money, does it mean all money is evil? Does it mean all money is bad? Does it mean wealth is evil? I don't think it does. I don't think it does. But I think uh, what Jesus is saying here is it's better understood when we add a portion from the book of James to it. In James chapter 1, you can turn there if you like, it's James chapter 1, verse 2. We actually talked about this Wednesday night in my, uh, my small group, um, and so I had to watch myself Wednesday night as I was uh, teaching my small group that I didn't preach the sermon in advance, and that's the difficulty when you get, uh, and so trust me, you get a lot of study. So here's what it says in James chapter 1, verse 2. It says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, in sta- unstable in all his way. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. So what it says, let the poor be proud that they are poor. Uh, and, let the rich in his, let, and let the rich be proud in his humiliation. Because like flowers of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass and the flower, as flowers falls and its beauty perishes. So, all, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So it says, poor people, be proud that you are in a lowly, low position. And rich people, be proud that you have the opportunity to be humbled. That's what it says. And it's, it's really... Uh, It's an interesting perspective on wealth because in today's culture and society, what do we think? We want to be wealthy because it validates us. It gives us the ability to do the things that we desire to do. But when we look at what Jesus says here or what's what's said here in the book of James, it says uh, you you should not suppose that you will receive anything from the Lord for he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Then it goes to talk about riches. And so as we talk about mammon, we talk about rich, riches and wealth, wealth, and we look at what it says in Luke. Here's what I think is the important understanding that we need to have. Money is not inherently evil, okay? But when we talk about being a double-minded, unstable man, and Jesus says you cannot serve both God and money, the reason is, is when our focus becomes on money, it takes our attention away from God. The reason that James says that the poor should be proud of their low position is because they are in a position in life where they need complete dependence on God. And those that are wealthy, when they are made low, they should be proud as well and celebrate because now they have gone from relying on themselves to now relying on God. It's not that the love of money is the issue. It's not that the, the having money is the issue. But when we focus our lives on trying to attain more, and that's our sole focus, we become like a double-minded man, unstable in all our ways. Mammon, in my definition, is, uh, it's a personal desire to try and become our own provider and to accumulate wealth. Money, that's the problem, right? right? After all, the Bible says money is the root of all evil, right? We, how many of you have seen this picture on Facebook? Have you seen this picture on Facebook? It's not there. So you haven't seen that? It's a cool picture. Let me describe it to you. It's a dollar bill folded up, right? You seen this? And it says, the root of all evil. It's got a dollar bill. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? Yeah, it's a cool looking picture. You know what? It's wrong. 
It's wrong. The Bible does not say money is the root of all evil. The Bible does not say that money is the root of all evil. Actually, in 1 Timothy 6.10, it says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Here's the reality. Money is neutral. Money and wealth is what we make it. It is neither evil nor good. People do good with money. People do bad with money. Here's what I think Jesus is saying when he's saying loving and serving mammon is the root of all evil. Jesus says that you can't serve God and mammon. Loving and serving mammon is the root of all evil is what he's saying. Wealth, serving wealth is the root of evil. When we love it so much that accumulating money becomes the end goal of our life, That's when we find ourselves struggling against who is our real master. Money is not evil. Our attitude towards money is what makes it evil or not. I often think uh, of the verse when it says, God will not put more on us than we can bear. Uh, I think perhaps that's why some of us don't have more money than we do. Because we would not handle it right. We would not do well with it. Think of what it said in Luke 16, 10. It says, faithful with a little, faithful with a lot. One of the reasons that wealth is so dangerous is that when we start to think of money that we've amassed over the times of our hard work, as we start to think of money and the things that we have purchased, we can start to think that the money is ours. And we begin to think like owners. We own it. We deserve it. I worked hard for it. Mammon is a spirit, but it's not the spirit that was taught in previous places. It's not an outside spirit. It's one that comes from our divided loyalties and our selfish desires. It's like that first car you bought. Now, if you're like me, and I know I am, uh, when you're a teenager, yeah, there you go. That's good. Just a little chuckle. When you're a teenager driving your parents' car, you didn't really pay attention to where you parked it, did you? Park it right next to the, the grocery, grocery cart corral right there. People run into it. You don't care. It's not yours. Right? It's like my, my dad has a theory. Why, the, reason, the reason kids are better on computers than adults are uh, is because it doesn't belong to them. They don't care if they break it. It's the same, reason, same way you were when you're driving your parents' car. You bump somebody else. Oops, Sorry. You park it wherever you can. You don't pay a, you pay a bit of attention to around you. But when you buy your own car for the first time, then you're starting to park in the very far corner of the parking lot. You are taking up two to three spots, parking diagonally, so no one could accidentally open the car door into yours, right? You make sure that there's no grocery carts around you, You check, because why? Because all of a sudden, it's mine. And when it is mine, when I am the owner of this car, I am going to take good care of it because I don't want somebody else to hit it. We're thinking like an owner, and taking care of our property becomes our top priority when we think like an owner. And that's how mammon affects us. Wealth, greed, the desire for more, it worms itself into our relationship with God because we start thinking it belongs to us. We really have to change our thinking about uh, money and possessions. When we think like an owner, we start thinking in our own self-reliance. I'm taking care of myself. I'm taking care of my needs. We have to move from the mindset of an owner that leans on mammon, that desires personal wealth and the acquisition of wealth, to a different mindset. And that mindset is that of a steward. We have to think of ourselves as a steward. There's there's so much said in the Bible about money. There's over 2,000 verses uh, in it talking about uh, money and budgeting. 
and, and giving, you know, greed, idolatry, work, riches, savings, interest, taxes to the poor. It talks about all of the different aspects of money. Being a steward or stewardship is an important part of our Christian life. And I want you to understand that the Bible is very clear. The Bible is very clear. We are to stu- be good stewards of everything that God has given us. The word steward uh, says that we are to be, it, it, the, word, the Bible says as a steward we are to become a faithful Steward. You also see it used throughout the New Testament, the word for steward. You see it as manager is another word for it. You and I are stewards of everything that God has given to us. He has given it to us and he entrusts it to us and we are responsible to take care of it and manage it. We are responsible to show a good return on it and steward, stewarding what God has given us is not an optional activity. How many of you remember the parable of the talents? One was given five, one was given three, one was given one. The one that was given one buried it in the sand, did nothing with it. The one that was given three, he doubled it. The one that was given five, they doubled it. What happened to the one that was given one? Did he steward the resource? No, he just protected it and guarded it. He didn't do anything with it. He didn't multiply it. And at the end of the day, what happened to that resource that he was given? It was taken away from him and given to the one that had doubled. Why? Because the one that had doubled had steward that resource well. Stewardship when we get this right, we understand stewardship, when we start looking at what we have and what we, what we have in our lives, when we start looking at stewardship correctly, we start to see spiritual growth in our life. That is why stewardship is essential to this understanding of growing in the blessed life and, and how God has called us to live. All of a sudden, you start to mature as a follower of Jesus Christ. Things start to fall in place. The reality in our life is there's no maturity without stewardship. Maturity and stewardship go together. Tim Keller is a wonderful pastor. He says, there can be no significant spiritual growth unless you put your money and your attitude towards it in God's hands. Go back to where we started the sermon Go back to where we started the sermon in Genesis 1. God created everything and he gave us dominion over it. God owns everything and we are simply the managers. Here's the mindset of a steward. God owns everything and we are the money managers, the talent managers and the time managers. He owns everything and we are simply the managers. Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 says, Do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. It's, it's all. Everything that we have, everything that we have been entrusted with, he's saying, I'm giving these things to you. I'm giving these things to you for you to take care of. I've given you dominion over this world, is what he says. And you're the manager of it. This is not actually in the sermon. It's a little sidebar. That's why the conversation about environmentalism is always an interesting one to me. Because it's not seen as a religious conversation. But how we take care of this earth matters. Do you know why it matters? Because God gave us dominion over this earth. We should care for it because it is a resource that he has given us. But oftentimes that's not looked at as a, as a religious issue, is it? It's looked at as a political issue. But it's a religious one, how we take care of this world. Because God gave us dominion over it. It matters. We should care about these things. When God gives us management of things, it gives us a freedom in liberty. Because when you're an owner, what are you trying to do? You're trying to gain more possessions. You're trying to gain more uh, wealth. You're trying to gain more. But when you're a manager, none of of it is yours to begin with. And so if you do want to grow in more, and again, like we said, having more wealth is not an automatically bad thing. It's when the goal is to gain more wealth. If we want to grow, what do we need to do? We need to manage what he has given us. 
We need to manage it well. If we don't manage it well, we should have no expectation that we are going to receive more. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting mindset. It's kind of like UPS. Okay, UPS is an interesting one. They carry thousands and thousands of packages a day. Uh, they, they, they carry all these packages, and if you're the driver, you have hundreds of packages in your truck. But those packages don't actually belong to the driver, do they? They belong to all the people that they're delivering to. The driver is strictly the manager of those packages. We are the same way. We don't actually own anything. Once we uh, accept Christ in our lives, what we do is we're saying, we're giving you everything, God. Everything. My time, my treasures, my talent. It's all yours. And you know, when we talk about stewardship, when we talk, talk about stewardship, um, oftentimes, what do we think of? It's, it's, it's the first mindset that people have is we start thinking about money. That's the first thing we talk about. And, you know, stewardship, part of it is money. Part of it's money. And when we start talking about money, we start talking about money, that's when people start getting real quiet in church. Because now we've gotten really personal. You remember that first week, we know that the reason we needed a heart transplant, we talked about the first week in The Blessed Life, the reason people need a heart transplant is because there's an invisible string that runs from your heart to the wallet, and I know it because I can see when you grab that wallet, that little twinge of pain. And how many of you started thinking, Pastor, you're already meddling in my life here. Would you stop? But I'm, I'm not going to. You know why? Because I want you to live a blessed life. I want you to be blessed by God. I, I, watched, uh, I, I, was, I was watching a conversation in a minister's forum, uh, and somebody was asking, do you teach tithing at your church? And I said, yeah, we teach tithing every week. We do our little offering talk every single week. We talk about the importance of giving and tithing to God. And uh, somebody, you know, the Bible tells us very clearly um, that if we don't tithe, we are robbing God. That's what Malachi says, right? Um, and from a pastoral standpoint, if I don't teach tithing, I'm robbing you. I'm robbing you of the opportunity to be blessed. I'm robbing you of the opportunity to be obedient. If I don't teach you what God says about giving and money and stewardship, then I am robbing you of the opportunity to live in the fullness of what God wants you to do. So oftentimes, when we think of stewardship, we think here. We think of the offering bucket being passed around. Now, we don't use actual buckets. Uh, we use the, we use the, the velour bags, and uh, we think they look better churchy-wise. But some churches just pass buckets. How many of you have ever been to, you've been to a meeting where they pass a bucket? And we think that this is stewardship. When we give our tithes, when we give our offering, we are using the resources that God has given us correctly. Correctly, we think that this is stewardship. Well, I want to tell you, stewardship actually looks a little different. Now, oftentimes it starts with this. We have to start somewhere, right? We have to start somewhere. But actual stewardship, when you say yes to God, actual stewardship is this. We get in the bucket. We stand in the bucket. And we say, God, everything I have is yours. My time, my talent, my relationships, my resources, my treasure, everything I have is yours. And we think that stewardship is just a matter of giving finances and making sure that we're using our money correctly, but that's not really the full extent of stewardship. Stewardship is giving everything to God, holding nothing back. And if we remember, guess what? All of it was already God's to begin with. When we start thinking like a steward, we change how we think about giving. We change how we think. See, oftentimes people, when, they, when the offering bucket comes around them, if they're thinking like an owner, they'll throw 20 bucks in the bucket and say, hey, God, here you go. I'm giving you 20 bucks. And they act like they've done some amazing, magnanimous act of giving God 20 bucks. An owner thinks, how much do I have to give? A steward thinks, how much do I get to keep? Because all of it belongs to God. How much does God ask for back? 10%. A steward asks, how much do I get to keep? Because they understand it does not belong to them to begin with. 
It belongs to God. Do we have any Lord of the Rings fan in, fans in here? I know Sean Pfeiffer is a Lord of the Rings fan. Um, I just know that because he, he had a, a reference last week to Lord of the Rings as we were talking. Any big Lord of the Rings fan? All right, we got a few here. How many remember that second one where they talk about the steward of Gondor? And the steward of Gondor, he opposed the king of Gondor. We don't need to go through the whole, the whole story. You can go watch the movies. If you have 12 hours, you can do that. It's fine. Um, get the extended version. It's going to take 16 hours. Uh, bonus footage, another 120 hours. It's, it's amazing. That might not be a good stewardship of your time, um, just so you're aware. Uh, anyways, but so the steward of Gondor gets in a fight with the rightful king of Gondor. Why? Because the steward of Gondor was given control of the city of Gondor and started to think that the city of Gondor was actually his city, that he owned it. And therefore, anyone that came to take it away from him, whether he was the rightful owner or not, was trying to take his stuff. That's why we have to think of ourselves as a steward and a manager. Because when we think of ourselves as an owner, when your pastor starts talking about money, you start feeling like he's meddling in your business. What does the Bible tell us? Our ability to produce wealth comes from God. Our ability to work, our ability to do anything comes from God. And when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we're not just giving him this. We're giving him this that says, I am all in. There's a maturity that happens in our lives when we understand that God owns it all. How much more can I give towards God? See, here's the, here's the freedom. There's a joy in living, understanding that it's not ours. It's God's. If we manage what he's given us, what's what Luke 16.10 says? If you're faithful with a little, you'll be faithful with a lot. How many of you are feeling a little challenged this morning? Have you been faithful with what God has given you already? If you have not been, why would we anticipate Him giving us more? And this isn't about giving to get. Because if we give with the motive of getting more, guess what? We have just worked selfishness into our life, and we are serving that, that spirit, the spirit of mammon that says, I'm giving so that I can get more wealth. That's not the right attitude in our giving. I give because God has told me I have dominion over that which he has created, and I give because he has also commanded me to give. Give treasures, time, talent, resources. He has given, he has called us to do this. And there's a freedom. There's a freedom in doing that. Because it wasn't yours to begin with. And if you can take something that doesn't, it's, it's the joke that pastors use during offering. Have you, you've probably heard this. Reach over into your neighbor's wallet and give like you've always wanted to. You'll hear it again. I said, just, just, pastors have got all sorts of bad jokes. They're almost as bad as dads. And so, uh, but when we can give like we want to because we understand that my money, my time, my talents, my resources, it's not mine. And if God gave it to me in the first place, if I live like he's called me to live, if I give like he's called me to give, who's going to make sure that my needs are supplied? The same one who gave it to me in the first place. I am the manager of God's resources. You, actually, that's the funny thing. The, the name Spencer means um, the giver of the Lord's provision. That's actually what it means in Old English. Uh, and so uh, that actually just occurred to me as I was, I was talking there. But there's a freedom and the joy in living like you're just a manager. Because you're not responsible for your own provision, are you? See, when we think like an owner... We're thinking that we have to be self-reliant. We have to take care of ourselves. 
But when we recognize that God owns everything, and we are just the managers of our time, our talent, our treasures, our assets, we, we often, we say ours, mine, to get a sense that it belongs to us. But here's, here's why it's so freedom, so freeing when we realize it comes from God. He gave it to us in the first place. If we're faithful with it, he'll give it to us again. And I don't want to spend my time here on this earth trying to accumulate wealth because it's a waste of my time. Because all of it belongs to God anyways. I'm not taking it with me when I die. And so if I spend all of my time on this earth you know, trying to just accumulate wealth, what I'm forgetting about is how I use what God has given me affects eternity. But if I spend, think of this as a line. If I spend all my time on this little dot trying to accumulate wealth and resources and never giving towards the work of God, I have no impact on eternity. But God has called us here to grow His kingdom. That's why He's called us to be the managers of His resources. He gave us dominion. But if we think like owners, we serve the attitude of mammon that says, I have to accumulate everything. But when we start thinking like stewards and managers, we start thinking, God, how can I take the talents, times, resources, and assets that you've given me and funnel them into your kingdom? How can I, funnel, how can I give more of what you've given me so that I can bless others in eternity? I believe that one of, the, one of the keys to us growing as a church is for us to grow in our generosity. We have to funnel more of the resources that God has entrusted us. We have to funnel more of them into the work of the kingdom. I want to see myself as God's delivery boy. I want to be the UPS driver, delivering what God has given me to where God has directed me to give it. And everything in my life is His. We are to each give Him every piece that we have because it's His. We find it easier to respond to His call when we look at our lives as a steward because my life is His to direct and guide. It's easier to live generously, to be open-handed because it all comes from God, and we can see that it will continue to come from Him if we are faithful stewards of what He has given us. Here's the general idea as we're talking about the blessed life. As we talk about the blessed life, we talk about a heart transplant that we would reflect, that we would give because our Father gave. Then we talked about immediate obedience. The idea today is this. We have to move from ownership to stewardship because as we move from ownership to stewardship, we move from self-reliance to complete dependence on God. Opening our lives up to being totally dependent upon Him and not our own resources and efforts, guess what? It opens us up to the blessings of God because we acknowledge, I have nothing, I am nothing without God's provision in my life. We have to step into the bucket and give everything to God and see what blessings He brings. Bow your heads with me in prayer.